by um, by congratulating Amra on um, coordinating this very important event. And I'd also like to congratulate her on the excellent opening talk that she gave yesterday morning. Um, it really set the tone for what we're exploring in this conference together. Um, let me just briefly introduce myself. Um, I'll be the moderator for this session. My name is Trevor Marshall. I'm a professor of social anthropology at the School of Oriental and African Studies. Um, and I suppose what brought me to, um, to this world of recovery and reconstruction is that um, I've had the luxury of working in a number of field sites over the last three decades as an anthropologist. Um, but unfortunately, several of which have been afflicted by conflict and also by natural disaster. My earliest field work was in Zaria, northern Nigeria, working with the mud masons there followed on by working with minaret builders in Sana'a, Yemen, and then with mud masons in Jene, Mali. I also did a short stint of field work in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. And as all of you will know, um, all four of these sites have been affected by conflict, and in the case of Sana'a, by natural disaster um, over the years. So we have four terrific papers um, this morning, and um, I just want to introduce the theme of this, um, of this panel session. Um, by drawing upon experiences of processing societal trauma, the aim of this panel is to identify potential roles that cultural memory might play in coming to terms with past abuses, denials of human rights, armed conflict, and expulsion. Given the centrality of human experience in the event of heritage destruction, and the manner in which people's attachment to place and community is strategically targeted during armed conflict, key questions for this panel to consider and discuss include, what meanings do victims of violence attach to heritage reconstruction? What does heritage mean to those struggling to survive physically, socially, and economically? In what ways might reconstructing cultural heritage assist victims in processing trauma? How might recovery of heritage be beneficially integrated with efforts to ensure justice and reparations, to attend to the psychological needs of victims to establish dialogue and trust, and to bridge social divides? How might international solidarity and the provision of necessary resources contribute to the creation of inclusive strategies for recovering heritage and community? So I think that um, these questions are really wonderfully addressed in the, uh, in the four presentations that you're going to hear this morning. Um, just before I introduce the first paper, um, just to let speakers know that um, you have 20 minutes, um, I will time that um, and I will, well, I'll let you know um, when there are just a few minutes left. Um, if we can please keep to time because we have a rather tight schedule this morning and we'll be looking forward to hearing from those who have agreed to offer their reflections to us at the end of the panel session. So our first presentation this morning is from Dacia Viejo Rose, who has co-authored a paper with her colleague, Rachel Killian. Dacia Viejo Rose is a senior lecturer in heritage and the politics of the past in the Department of Archaeology at the University of Cambridge, where she is also deputy director of the Cambridge Heritage Research Center. And she's also director of studies in archaeology at Selwyn College. Before entering academia, Dr. Viejo Jose worked as a consultant for several international organizations and cultural policy institutes. Her first book was Reconstructing Spain, Cultural Heritage and Memory After Civil War. The paper that she and Rachel have co-authored is titled Destruction of Heritage as a Strategy of Mass Violence, Assessing Harm to Inform Meaningful Measures of Repair. Dacia, I pass the floor to you.
Tasia, if I may, your microphone is muted. Excellent, um, share screen. Okay, um, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you before I begin um, to the organizers of this conference, which was meant to happen um, so long ago now in, in Manama. Um, and which of course has had to be delayed and, and transposed and reinvented in so many ways. But thank you so much for um, to Shadia Tukhan and then to of course Mohammed and Amra for their fearless leadership and bringing us all together um, for this these three days. Um, right, so what I wanted to talk about, and this is, this is work that Rachel and I have, have done together, but I'm going to be drawing on in this presentation on work on, on lots of different, from different angles. So work on, on Spain, um, work that we, a little bit of work on, on Mali, work that Rachel and I did in the context of a broader project on, in Cambodia, and lots of other examples to try and hone in on this, this idea of cultural heritage as an element in, in violence, and especially moving us towards an idea of how we could inform how a, a expanded understanding of the way in which cultural violence is done and heritage is destroyed could help us and inform meaningful measures of, of repair and, and reparation. Okay. So the outline of the talk briefly, um, three sections, first talking about cultural violence and heritage and the way that I understand these two to work together. Um, which goes from a changed understanding of heritage, this expanded notion that we work with today, to then applying that to understanding how that then is um, used in, in wartime and how it um, becomes a target of violence. And then to see on that basis, so that, every, that building on that, what is the harm and how can we assess the harm done by that kind of violence and responses to that violence and from there moving to a new way of formulating a reformulation of both reconstruction and ideas of repair and reparation as we move forward and instruments and organizations like the ICC, the International Criminal Court and the Trust Fund for Victims try to elaborate um, new methods or ways of repairing this kind of violence. So this is the kind of violence that we're familiar seeing right in terms of when we think of the destruction of cultural heritage this is we see we think of these big um, very performative very dramatic events almost um, and that is reinforced by the way that the media reports on these events and by the way in which politicians and leaders of international organizations such as unesco talk about these events and there are reasons for doing that right for um, attracting international attention in order to get funds, in order to be able to do things. So that there are reasons why these uh, events are so mediatized and talked about in these ways. And, and they're incredibly dramatic, right? But they're also that, they're performances. And one of the things I want to get at is what sits underneath all of these, because these are not even the tip of the iceberg. I mean, they're still at the tip of tip, but what happens underneath? What makes it possible for this kind of violence to take place? And what under you know what underlies it, and what are the consequences that I think we have to understand beyond the dramatic um, event. And so to do that, I just want to I know everybody in this meeting knows this very well already, but just to remind us all of the shift in terms of how we have been thinking about cultural heritage. Where here are these two ICOMOS um, documents, right? You have the Venice Charter of 1964, the Quebec Charter of 2008. And you see this evolution from thinking about heritage as monuments, uh, historic monuments, architectural sites, archaeological sites in need of conservation and preservation to thinking about the interpretive dimension of heritage and the, the importance of interpretation and significance taking over from authenticity as a core value of heritage. And you see the same kind of shift in the UNESCO conventions, if you go back to the Hague Convention of 1954, 
of course, the World Heritage Convention of 72, and move to more recent conventions on intangible cultural expressions, diversity of expressions. You also see that shift from thinking of protecting heritage as putting a bell jar or over an object that is fragile, that's delicate, that needs safeguarding or protection to something much more of a, of a living process, right? Which has creativity built into it, diversity built into it. And so what that means also, you know, heritage is more than a monument, but what does that mean? What are the implications of it being more than a monument? Because the Intangible Heritage Convention reminds us that you know intangible and tangible go together and that they need to work in a, in a synergetic relationship. So it means that heritage being more than a monument means that there are all these other meanings, all these other ways in which heritage is, functions, is called upon, is related to, is associated to by people, by collectives, by communities, by nation states, right? All of that goes into the, the kind of capital, the symbolic capital of heritage. It's, so the way that I've increasingly thinking about heritage isn't even as a process, and, but as an ecosystem, and that the relations between things need to be taken into consideration and need to be cared for, the relations between things, not just the objects or the sites themselves. So heritage conveys meaning. The way heritage is used and presented constructs meaning, and it's highly affective and emotional, as well as, of course, political. So if we take all that into consideration, then how can we understand it when heritage is targeted, right? So this is an attempt to just create a little bit of a, not really a typology, but just to break things down a little bit. What is the destructive action, right? What, there's all different ways of destroying heritage. So if we look at what type of destructive action and then the object targeted, and then of course the context of the conflict. And these aren't exhaustive lists. They're just giving you examples of how we can unpack each of these ways of action and targets and context so that we can begin to think and see that you know, if the deliberate targeting of a cemetery behind the front lines in the context of an ethnic conflict is one thing. It tells you a certain story, right? There's a narrative. It tells you something about motivations. This targeting behind the front lines of a cemetery, you know, it's an attempt to erase any proof, any evidence that a particular community ever lived there and therefore take away any claims they might have to a heritage of that place, in that place, a sense of belonging in that place, right? That's the kind of violence that, that, of that action. But vandalism of a political monument, I mean, think of the vandalism of the statues in, in Bristol that last summer in the UK, right? That's very different. But then if you think about it in the state, in the context of state failure due to ideological conflict, well, think of the toppling down the Lenin fall, right? The toppling down of all these statues to Lenin. Both of these examples, the deliberate targeting of a cemetery behind enemy lines in the context of ethnic conflict or the vandalism of a Lenin statue in the context of the collapse of the Soviet Union, they're both destruction of cultural heritage, but they're not the same at all. They, you know, we really have to say what we mean when we talk about destruction of cultural heritage, what kind of destruction. And there are very, very many different kinds, different motivations, and each one has different consequences. Okay? So then let me add to that um, kind of expose of how I understand cultural violence and how we can break it down, an additional element. So that here I'm drawing on the work of Johann Geltung, who's this peace theorist, who talks about how direct violence, so those images of the explosion of, of heritage sites, right, of Mbamian and Palmyra, that's only possible if other forms of violence also exist in tandem. So he argues structural violence and cultural violence. Structural violence being a state of violence which allows for direct violence to occur, where there's a systematic oppression or a sense of um, different types of access to rights, different kinds of equality, therefore not equality, people having different rights, right? So there's a structural violence. You have these kinds of rights, you have those kinds of rights. And then there's cultural violence, which is, he argues, the way in which we make sense of and normal, normalize 
and justify the fact of structural and direct violence. So Slavo Zizek, the philosopher, also talks about this. He calls these slightly different things. What, what I think is important in terms of understanding the violence against cultural heritage is that sense that for that, for those moments to exist, that we see those dramatic moments, other forms of violence of, against culture, against heritage have to also exist. And part of that is in the structural violence. What is recognized officially, and here we get into that authorized heritage discourse, the top down, what is officially recognized as heritage? That selection can be a violent one when some sites are deliberately not selected, not valued, right? And then the cultural violence is the way in which we justify those decisions. Oh, because that's not so important. Oh, because that's just everyday stuff. That's not exceptional. Those kinds of justifications. And that's the kind of cultural violence, which I feel is also important to understand when we look at, when we're trying to understand the impact of, of violence against cultural heritage on people, on everyday life, on societies, and on chances of recovering from violent conflict. So here's that typology again, and I've added to it, right? So other forms of destructive actions, they don't necessarily need to be physical. So if we all agree that heritage is also intangible, then the destruction of heritage can also occur intangibly. So it can be a rhetorical destruction. It can be a rhetorical targeting through propaganda, through a disowning of heritage, through not teaching, right? Through a lack of inclusion in curricula and school curricula and school textbooks of part of history or people not being represented in those history textbooks. That's also violence against heritage. There can be exclusions of all kinds, right? And the objects targeted can be historical narratives, constructions of identity, ideas and senses of belonging and ownership, okay? So let me give you an example of propaganda attacking um, the, the construction of identity. This is um, a case that you might all be familiar with where Saddam Hussein in his restoration conservation work on Babylon included bricks with his name, right? So he has, he's imprinting his own name on the site of, of Babylon and appropriating the site in doing so, right? And here you have an image of Saddam Hussein as an Assyrian conqueror and you have the combinations collapse of history with the Assyrian symbology, but also the Patriot missiles overhead. Right? And that's an appropriation also by Saddam Hussein of this Assyrian past. And this is one of the reasons that Donnie George, who was the director of the museum, National Museum in Baghdad during the 2003 invasion, I heard him speak in London in 2005. And he was saying that one of the ways of trying to understand why some Iraqis did target Assyrian objects was because they were no longer theirs. They weren't, they didn't, they were representations of Saddam Hussein. They weren't attacking their own heritage. They were attacking Saddam Hussein's heritage. And that's because the violence had already happened, right? Saddam Hussein in appropriating the Assyrian past had already disowned Iraqis from that past and Iraqis that weren't in favor of Saddam Hussein from that past. So that in essence, this type of destruction of Assyrian objects was the equivalent, sorry, was the equivalent of tearing down a statue of Saddam Hussein. Okay, that's the kind of destruction that was, if you try and context, if you really put it into a contextualized framework, right? So that's my argument about the type of just the way in which the destruction of cultural heritage can occur and the different modes of destroying cultural heritage that aren't just the big dramatic events, but that occur in little ways and every way of kind of this disowning and all kinds of different intangible forms of violence as well. So what's the harm, right? What's the harm when that violence isn't just in those moments, but on an everyday basis of exclusion and disowning of people from national narratives? And this is where I think the one of the issues with how the reconstruction and attempts at repair and reconciliation have been handled um, up until recently, is that a lot of focus has been on the physical integrity, right? So the Mostar Bridge is one example where the destruction of the bridge and then the subsequent was, was so dramatic, so felt by people around the world 
that then the reconstruction of the bridge and the whole project around that was very much focused on the materiality, on the material authenticity of using the stones, of recovering the stones from the Neretva River, of going to the original stone quarries, of rebuilding the bridge as it was. And, and so much energy, focus, expertise was really um, on that, on reconstructing the material authenticity, the material integrity of the bridge that was destroyed. And to me, one of the failures of that project was that it didn't consider all the rest, the meanings, the associations, the emotions related to that bridge and what therefore the reconstruction of the bridge, what messages it might be sending, that wasn't controlled. Nobody really knew what was going on, what, what was being sent, what messages were being sent with this reconstruction that were maybe not so conducive to reconciliation and recovery. Okay. So how do we get to that? Well, I've tried to understand what, what victims say about the loss of heritage, right? And here is Guernica. I did a lot of work on the civil wars in Spain. So when the destruction of Guernica happened, the, the reaction of people was that it no longer existed, right? It had been annihilated. And you have the same kind of responses uh, in the aftermath of the destruction of mausoleums in Timbuktu that sense that it's not just their home, their buildings, their town, that have, their shrines that have been destroyed, but they have been shaken to the very root of themselves, their sense of security, of safety, of home, of knowing the world. And this is where I think we need to all continue to expand our understanding of heritage, that it's not just about being tangible and intangible. Heritage is a framework for people to under, make sense of their place in their world, their belonging in the world. And so when that is targeted, then it's that sense of belonging in the world that is also affected and shaken, you think? So that sense of the faith being shattered, belief unsettled, attachment to place being lost, which is so difficult to come back from and recover. So if we assess the types of harm done, okay, when, when heritage is targeted, people are excluded from collective communal narratives of belonging intergenerational transmission of knowledge, of know-how, of, of what that community values is broken. There's this loss of cultural resources and capital for the community to draw on as kind of lieu de memoir, as common grounds, right? There's a silencing of interpretations, of a diversity of interpretations in favor of a singular narrative. There's an essentialization of differences, us, them. There's no room for gray areas and in-betweenness and nuances in conflicts. So it creates these ruptures in time, in transmission, and it disappears people, voices, narratives, understandings of heritage, valuations of heritage, and it dis disowns people, degrades. So how do we come back from that? Because that are, those are the consequences of the destruction of cultural heritage that we need to come back from and try and repair. So how do we go about doing that? Okay. So reconstruction, you know, and you see these kinds of projects about the, the kind of the Palmyra arc and the, the 3D printout of it traveling around the world. And the question for me always when I see this is, but, but who's this for? What's it for? What's it really doing? Who's it really helping? Okay. Kathy, you have two minutes. Okay. Okay, I'll rush. Um, so we're going to Mostar and just, again, in Mostar, what was going on on either side of that bridge is what's important and why it was going on on either side of the bridge. So reconstruction can be broken down into, it's about rebuilding, revisioning, recodifying space, rewriting history, remembering and how we remember, and to go to the final bit of my presentation to repair and how do we repair it and recover. So what I'm trying to do is to break this kind of cycle of violence by which reconstruction and remembering, memorization, commemoration after war actually perpetuates the cycles of violence rather than moving on towards an, a stage of reconciliation. So reparation can be understood as restitution, compensation, or justice, okay? Restitution we're familiar with. It's the Treaty of Versailles. You know, you, these many books were lost in Yuvan. These many books have to be returned to Yuvan by those who destroyed and burned down the library, okay? And then there's the form of um, compensation. So the Stella of Matera destroyed by the Ethiopian army in Eritrea. Eritrea says, right, you need to give us the money to restore and repair it. Um, Ethiopia gives the money 
that that cost Eritrea says yeah but that wasn't enough that doesn't really account for our loss so they continue to negotiate and this shows just how monetary compensation is is never really satisfactory as a as a method of repair and then there's reparation as, as kind of justice as acknowledgement as accountability as remedying the victim's harm as the responsible actor atoning and and acknowledging their responsibility right and then if we look at al mahdi and the al mahdi case and learn from the al mahdi case okay what was okay, he pleaded guilty sentenced and there is this really interesting element of the icc's reparations order which acknowledged harm three different types of harm the physical the economic and the moral and the moral one is the one that i'm particularly interested in and the ways in which the court proposes to repair the moral harm are through symbolic measures such as memorials commemorations or forgiveness ceremonies right the bit i've highlighted in yellow and this we come to the Chan community in Cambodia and the work that I did with um, Rachel, which we went to the community in the, the Chan community and said, okay, so would you like a forgiveness ceremony? Would you like a memorial? And the answer was no and no. That's not what they wanted. That's what the, not what they needed because the harm that was done was in these ruptures, right? So what they felt that they needed was very different from what was being offered. And so these are the ways in which the, the harm was experienced, right? When we returned, there was nothing left, right? Those who were educated were killed and those that were left didn't know. We didn't have anything of value to transmit. So it's that rupture that, create, that was created where there was, they didn't feel there was anything they could call their own to transmit to future generations. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry. Um, I'm I have to be a strict timekeeper because we have such a full session. I'm going to ask you to, um, if you could just conclude perhaps with a last thought for us. You've given us already a very rich paper. Um, yeah. Maybe something that you could conclude with. Um, so I can conclude with this slide, which is that reparation requires repair. How do you repair moral harm? You need to reappear, reown, return a sense of dignity and justice. And that's it in my acknowledgements. Thank you very, very much. I really did not enjoy having to cut you off. You gave us a, a tremendously rich paper. And I particularly um, enjoyed at the beginning how you made us kind of rethink um, the whole process rather than a process, in fact, as an ecosystem. Um, I thought that was really a wonderful metaphor. And you illustrated that beautifully um, by providing us with a, a structure to think with and to, to think carefully with about how we might take the appropriate action. So thanks so much. Um, hopefully we will be able to come back to these ideas in the reflections. Um, if I may, I would like to bring us to our second presentation um, this morning. This is a, a presentation that is co-authored by Marilena Kolya, Rafif Alamasi, and Nara Anaptawi. Just briefly um, to introduce the, uh, the three authors, uh, Marilena is a psychologist with an MSc in Environment and Behavior. She has worked in the humanitarian sector since 2015 in the fields of mental health and psychosocial support and protection. She is currently working in the occupied Palestinian territories with Première Urgence Internationale on projects centered on the prevention of and response to different coercive environmental factors in the occupied West Bank and Gaza Strip. Rafif Alamasi is an architect with an MSc in Sustainable Building Technologies. She is currently working with Première Urgence Internationale in the Gaza Strip to raise community awareness of Palestinian cultural heritage and to advocate for the cultural rights of Palestinians. Nada Anaptawi is an architect and is also working with Première Urgence Internationale in the Gaza Strip, and she is supporting PUI's positioning within the protection sector, pr protection sector there, and is helping to further the protection mainstreaming efforts within the mission, including incorporation of intersectional issues such as age, gender, diversity, and disability across programming areas. The title of their paper today is Historical Trauma and Cultural Heritage, Intical 2030 in the Gaza Strip. I turn the floor over to our presenter this morning. 
Thanks a lot, Trevor, for the introduction. I will uh, start sharing my screen really quickly. And for my colleagues here, Nada and Rafif, you can just tell me when to, to change the slides at, on your part. So again, thanks a lot for the introduction. We're very excited to be here today to present our paper, Greetings from Palestine. I'm currently in the Occupied West Bank and my colleagues Nada and Rafif are in the Gaza Strip. We're going to be talking a little bit today about how we contextualize uh, the theory of historical trauma using cultural heritage in the context of the Gaza Strip. I will start by giving a little bit of a brief theoretical introduction, more specifically around the concept of historical trauma and how we're using it in our paper. Then my colleague Nada will take the floor to talk a little bit about the current situation in the Gaza Strip. We will focus on the recent escalation of May 2021. So because, you know, the history of violence in Gaza, unfortunately, is quite uh, long standing and uh, 20 minutes is definitely not enough to address it all. So we will be focusing on the latest escalation. And lastly, my colleague uh, Rafif will take the floor to talk a little bit about how we use cultural heritage practically to um, move to processing historical trauma in the Gaza Strip. So let's get into it. I hope everybody can see my screen. Yeah. So let's start from the concept of historical trauma. By definition, the term historical trauma is used to describe a collective adverse experience lived by a group of people um, having similar characteristics and spanning across different generations. So the main characteristics of historical trauma are the wounding, the shared group experience and the across generational character. And I want to highlight here how we use the term historical trauma because I think there is a lot of, sorry, it moves. There's a lot of misuse around the term of trauma and being a psychologist myself, there can be sometimes a misinterpretation of what we mean by trauma and there can be some clinical implications that we really want to avoid. We don't use the word trauma to imply any kind of clinical condition, any mental health issues or any individual kind of issues. It's more a term to reflect the colonial and post-colonial studies, studies bibliography and it's it's used more or less to reflect on the kind of group experience of adversity and again, not to describe any kind of uh, individual psychological issues or mental health issues. And it's important to highlight it. That's why sometimes I will be using the term trauma in quotes because by definition, the term trauma is a clinical term. And here by historical trauma, we use it to describe adversity that has a historical span. Okay, just to, to clarify, wait. So what uh, we used as the theoretical background in our paper is the model of the trauma grid proposed by Papadopoulos in 2007. Basically, the trauma grid describes how, let's say, interpersonal adversity can have various effects on individuals and communities. So the different effects of uh, adversity as proposed by Papadopoulos can be negative, neutral, and positive. So he puts different kind of definitions and his point is to make sure we move away from the um, narrative that any kind of adversity has only negative effects to people that are experiencing it. So he puts the concept of adversity activated development in the center of his model. And this is something that really inspired us, especially when considering, when reflecting on the concept of historical trauma. Ma Maria Elena, if I may. Sorry. Yes. Sorry to interrupt you. Can you just uh, slow down for the interpreter to follow? I am really sorry. Yes. Thank you very sorry. much. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can speak very, very quickly sometimes. Yes. Okay. So basically, we based our our reflections on the concept of on the model of the trauma grid, and we conceptualized the historical trauma grid. So based on the historical trauma grid that we propose in our paper we believe that there can be three different possible responses to historical trauma. And these responses can be either individual or community responses. There can be negative responses, which is what we at the moment consider psychological injury, mental health issues, community disintegration on the negative spectrum. There can be neutral responses to historical trauma, which is what we call at the moment resilience. And there can be also positive responses to historical trauma, which is the concept of sorry, adversity activated development. So uh, using this uh, historical trauma grid, we proposed cultural heritage as a very invaluable tool to promote resilience and adversity activated development while mitigating the possible effects and likelihood of the possible negative uh, responses to historical trauma. So this is more or less the theoretical uh, background we used. And I will pass the floor now to my colleague Nada 
who will be talking again a little bit about the context in Gaza at the moment. Thanks a lot. The floor is yours, uh, Nada. Uh, thank you, Marlina. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this year marked uh, 54 years of Israeli occupation and 14 years of blockade uh, in the Gaza Strip. The situation in Gaza continued to get worse and worse, after, not only due to the Israeli occupation and the comprehensive blockade on Gaza Strip, but also on the uh, due to the Palestinian uh, political uh, division. Uh, besides the Israeli authorities uh, reducing the electricity to, uh, supplied to the Gaza Strip, which uh, uh, make impact all the Gazan aspects of life, uh, such as health, water and sanitation, agriculture and education. Uh, starting from May, uh, from March uh, 2020, the Palestinian Prime Minister of Health declared a state of emergency across the OBT uh, to contain the spread of COVID-19. However, the capacity of the Palestinian health uh, uh, system to cope with the spread of the pandemic is severely embedded, especially in Gaza, uh, 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 due to the ongoing conflict between Hamas and Israel, uh, Israeli blockade, the inter internal Palestinian political division, the chronic power defect, and uh, the shortages in specialized staff, uh, drugs, and equipment. If we want to talk about the escalation uh, which happened in, uh, in May 2021, it started uh, after the, uh, the escalation has been uh, raised uh, in April 2021 between Israel uh, and uh, the Palestinian in East Jerusalem, which uh, led the, uh, the conflict to, to increase in Gaza also. Uh, and since the evening of May 10th until May 19th, uh, uh, 2021, Israeli forces carried out hundreds of airstrikes and chilling on Gaza Strip. According to the latest updates uh, by the Ministry of Health on 3rd of June 2021, the hostilities resulted in uh, 256 uh, uh, deaths and 2,000 injuries in the Palestinian side. In Gaza, uh, at the highest of the escalation, no, uh, previous, uh, yeah, uh, the highest of this escalation, uh, 1,300 internally displaced people sought shelter and protection at UNRWA schools or with hosting community. Uh, until the August of 2021, uh, there was 8,500 internally displaced people remain with host families or uh, and in two UNRWA schools. Uh, an estimated of uh, 16,257 housing units sustained some degree of damage, as did uh, multiple water and uh, sanitation facilities and infrastructure, uh, 58 education facilities, nine hospitals, and 19 primary health care centers. Uh, next slide, please, Marlena. Uh, these charts show that 66 out of 256 deaths uh, were children. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, there were uh, 1,128 uh, houses are severely damaged and 15,129 houses sustained uh, some uh, major or minor damages. Uh, next, uh, Marlena. The charts uh, we are showing now uh, uh, shared by OCHA uh, uh, on August 20th, uh, on June 2021, uh, showed that uh, the number uh, of affected uh, severe uh, housing and housing in Gaza after the escalation. Uh, next slide, please. Here we can see some photos of uh, the, uh, illustrate the, the scale of destruction of housing of some uh, healthcare centers and houses during May 2021. And in the next slide also, these are the houses that's uh, severely damaged. And in the next slide, we, this is a healthcare center who was uh, damaged after uh, uh, an airstrike next to it in Gaza Strip. Uh, now I will give uh, the stage for my colleague uh, Rafif, uh, who will uh, talk about our program Intikal here in Gaza Strip. Thank you. Thank you, Anada. 
Uh, following my colleague Marlena presentation, I'm going to present the practical implementation of um, the framework, the theoretical framework around uh, HT and cultural heritage. Actually, I'm going to present Intiqal program, Intiqal 2030. Uh, Intiqal is a youth-led initiative supported by Premier Urgence International, and it's an innovative socio-economic uh, program that leverage on the protection of archaeological sites and engaging uh, communities, uh, including stakeholders and uh, graduates, universities, and all related uh, st stakeholders and communities to, uh, to take a part in this uh, holistic uh, protection uh, process, actually. Uh, this term, Intiqal, Intiqal, it's an Arabic term. It corresponds to the English term, uh, the meaning of moving forward, uh, the meaning of uh, uh, moving from a situation into another one, into a better one. This term was carefully chosen with us, with us to present that we are going to to move forward from our past into a brighter future. And uh, let's say that youth are the main actor in this program. Next, please. Our youth, including uh, beneficiaries, we have the technician workers, skilled workers, new graduates, and new students who are currently engaged in different activities, protection and uh, preserv uh, preservation, uh, tangible and also intangible cultural heritage, Palestinian cultural heritage in Gaza Strip. Next, please. This uh, diagram illustrates the uh, framework of Intiqal. It stands on three main pillars. The first one is cultural heritage conservation, which includes consolidation, restoration of archaeological sites, and uh, community engagement through digital and actual ways. And also it stands on environment that we are thinking about uh, how we can use and uh, renewable energies and rainwater harvesting and uh, to uh, rehabilitate the archaeological sites here in Gaza Strip. And also it stands on social and economic development. It's worth, it's worth mentioning that uh, the protection of both local heritage and people affected by conflict areas, it stands at the core of intiqal intervention. Next, please. Since December 2017s, BOI was working into two main archaeological sites in Gaza Strip. The first one, located in at the north of Gaza Strip, which is the Byzantine Church of Jabalia, and the second one is the St. Hilarion Ministry. During this rehabilitation process, yes, experts and new graduates were engaged in this process to rehabilitate uh, the two sites and also to build the capacities of those of youth uh, during the process of rehabilitation and restoration of the two archaeological sites. Next. This, this uh, is a photo for the St. Hilarium Ministry, which is uh, one of the most important sites, not only in Gaza Strip, but also in the Middle East area. Uh, it uh, has a very wide area and a very good potential to uh, not only protect and rehabilitate uh, the monument, but also to engage uh, youth and to engage communities into meaningful events and uh, activities in this site. The second uh, location is the Byzantine Church in, in Jabalia that BUI work on uh, protecting it. It actually, during the last uh, escalation in May, it was affected by uh, the Israeli airstrikes. And now we are going to rehabilitate it again. Next. Next, please. The, we have three main components and activities within Intiqal program. The first activity is protection and restoration of uh, tangible cultural heritage. The second activity is the capacity building program for uh, youth, uh, new graduates, and students. The third activity is promotion of Palestinian cultural heritage. Next, please. In this photo, you can see see the youth and the new graduates who are engaged and they were trained on uh, the scientific uh, process of restoration archaeological sites. And they were trained by experts from the French public school in Jerusalem about how to correctly preserve and uh, rest uh, restore the remains of the St. Hilary Ministry. 
we can say see the engaged females in this process. Students were trained on different training, uh, such as uh, stone masonry activities, pottery training, uh, training on mosaic restoration, and uh, uh, training on archaeological uh, uh, excavation. And actually, they started as a new graduate, and after uh, training about around 12 months, they was considered as uh, qualified workers who can undertake uh, restoration activities in the future. The aim of Antiqal was to create a local team who is who can be able to undertake and uh, to to undertake restoration activities in the future. Next. You can see in the future in the photo that uh, students and female students are working on restoring uh, mosaic of the Santillary Ministry. Uh, as a part, uh, the, the third uh, component is uh, the promotion of Palestinian cultural heritage. We worked on a very uh, diverse activities such as site visits. We organized a site visit for public from different areas in Gaza Strip to and encourage them to visit the site. And we also work on the training to a guide who are able now to make a, a guided tour to, to all visitors to the Santa Hilary Ministry. Next, please. Awareness rising sessions due, during COVID-19 situation, we has implemented a campaign, awareness rising campaign and awareness rising sessions and uh, through Zoom and through digital alternative, but actually we work on actual awareness rising session in, at schools, universities, local association, et cetera. Next, please. Another meaningful activities is to engage communities and youth uh, that we organized a voluntary work in uh, for youth, for interested youth uh, in uh, the archaeological sites. Youth come to the sites for one day to, to have this experience of uh, restoring the archaeological sites. They work on cleaning and uh, cleaning mosaic, cleaning and weeding activities, so they can understand how protection and restoration proce process can work. Next, please. Uh, we uh, actually all, we also make a drawing and uh, competitions for architects, for artists, and they, uh, as you see, they work on drawing a very interesting drawings in this site. Another activity is that uh, a mosaic uh, panel, a large mosaic panel about the Santa Hilary Ministry was created by uh, the communities. And uh, communities members, including the children, youth, uh, male and female, worked on uh, producing this uh, very large uh, mosaic panel that expressed the Santa Hilary Ministry. And it was placed in the, in, at the entrance of the ministry. Rafif, I just want to let you know that you have just two minutes left to conclude. Yeah, I'm going to finish. Okay, thank you. Well, actually, I would like to highlight that we in Intiqal, we can focus on uh, all mentoring activities with all form of community involvement have a consid considerable impact, not only on the archaeological sites, but also of on the engaged people. And we in Intiqal, we promote and care for um, creating and running safe spaces where youth, the kids and children can come to these archaeological sites and express uh, their feelings, their feels after this uh, uh, historical traumas and uh, after conflicts. Next. And uh, it's worth mentioning that we have another uh, collaborations and activities, and we are working currently with the Manchester Metropolitan University, represented by Dr. Faisal, on a study about uh, the relation between well-being and cultural heritage. And all of our beneficiaries, including workers, visitors, volunteers, uh, take a part of this study. Results of this study will be used uh, at educa for educational purposes and for the development of Intiqal program. Next. 
Uh, another activity that we are thinking to implement in the future, and uh, it's called the mosaic, mosaic making uh, activity. This activity uh, was suggested to, uh, to promote uh, the positive or neutral outcome of historical trauma in uh, Palestinian territories. It's a specific activity which is called study on mosaic making. This activity will be developed with the communities uh, and the goal is to study the impact, the positive and neutral impact of historical trauma of uh, the community. Next. Well, actually, Intiqal is a, uh, is a part of PUI effort to advocate for the role of culture for sustainable development. This program contributes to monitoring, collecting, and analyzing quantitative and qualitative data in the field of culture increasing the visibility of culture for the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, ensuring that no one is left behind. At the end, I would like to mention that our program was supported by the Cultural Protection Fund, uh, supported by British Council, uh, in partnership with the Department for Culture, Media and Sports, uh, in addition to the Alif Foundation. All activities were implemented in collaboration with the French Public School in Jerusalem, local association, partner universities, and the Palestinian Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities. Thank you. Shukran Jazilan, Marilena, Rafi, Wanada. Um, thanks for the rich paper. And again, apologies for having to, uh, to give you a time on that, Rafif. Um, it's the least enjoyable um, aspect of the job as moderators, having to be timekeeper. Um, our third paper this morning is going to be presented by someone who probably really doesn't need an introduction because I think she is well known to all of you, but I'm going to take the pleasure of introducing her briefly, nevertheless. Ambra, is currently director of the Center for Cultural Heritage at, Interna at the International Forum Bosnia and the ARC WH consultant and editor for the Conference on Integ Integrated Reconstruction and Post-Trauma Impact on Communities and the Social Economic Aspects of Recovery. As commissioner to preserving national monuments of Bosnia and Herzegovina from 2001 to 2016, Amra was responsible for the integration of cultural heritage with post-war recovery for the integration of cultural uh, heritage in the country. Amra taught the history of architecture and architectural conservation at the International University of Sarajevo and has been invited to lecture around the world on her expertise. She has worked on people-centered conservation pro projects and published widely, including her recent book, Heritage, War and Peace. Amra's paper today is titled Peace Building Through Heritage Rebuilding, Inclusive Heritage Discourse in Post-War Recovery in Bosnia. Amra, I hand over to you. Um, I hand over to you. Thank you very much. I'm so sorry. In this critical moment, uh, I lost the Zoom connection and I hope that it will not be repeated during my presentation. Thank you very much, Trevor. I haven't heard your introduction and maybe it's good to stay excellent. enough. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so let me share my screen. I hope that my screen is visible to everyone. Um, on November 9, 1993, at 10.37, exactly 28 years and 
one and something hour ago in the morning, the old bridge in Mostar collapsed. After being exposed to constant shooting by heaven projectiles from Croatian army artillery. The opening of my presentation with this rather well-known video clip is in memory to that event, which inflicted mental wound to many persons, and which in fact stayed one of the major components of societal and also historical trauma in Bosnia. So I will, in fact, cite here, often cited Mostar Bridge elegy, which Slavenka Draculic, a Croatian person who does not live in Bosnia, who uh, wrote a day or two after the Mostar Bridge was destroyed. And in fact, this Mostar Bridge elegy explained why we grieve more after the destroyed bridge than after seeing a human person killed. She says, we expect people to die. We count on our own lives to end. The destruction of a monument to civilization is something else. The bridge in all its beauty and grace was built to outlive us. It was an attempt to grasp eternity because it was the product of both individual creativity and collective experience, it transcended our individual destiny. A dead woman is one of us, but a bridge is all of us forever. The war in Bosnia came to an end with the International Conflict Resolution Agreement, known as the Dayton Peace Accord in December 1995. The very heart of the agreements, annexes six, seven, and eight, are dealing with the mutually interconnected issues of human rights, the return of refugees and displaced persons, and cultural heritage, respectively. Annex eight of the Dayton Accord has become a significant stamp of uniqueness of the peace settlement due to the fact that cultural heritage was recognized as one of 11 paramount agents for the establishment of sustainable peace. However, in the four post-war recovery phases that you can see here at the slide, um, it has been instrumentalized for different political purposes. And it also reflected um, social conditions in the society. So it is some kind of nexus. Cultural heritage, approach to cultural heritage um, uh, was an agent to uh, social processes and the uh, comprehensive situation that includes these political, ideological, uh, social conditions were reflected on the authorized heritage discourse in uh, uh, all these four phases, past conflict phase, recovery phase, recession phase, and we are now experiencing a threat of conflict relapse, which is in fact very imminent and Bosnia is at the verge of war again. Um, I will not elaborate uh, the change in nexus in all these phases, However, I will note that um, my paper today will refer to the second uh, recovery phase in this presentation. Adams defines destruction of cultural heritage in Bosnia as the violent efforts to remake the world in another image. There are a number of reports on the cultural heritage destruction statistics. If detached from the holistic descriptions of warscapes and human destinies, the figures in these records give an elusive and deficient portrayal. Numbers make abstract the destruction that was planned, selective, imbued with pseudo-ritual character and performed from proximity. 
Already in 1992, it was possible to define the two main targets of systematic destruction of Bosnian cities, their urban community and urban fabric. Shortly after the start of the war, the destruction of Mostar and Sarajevo was defined as Orbisi. With studies on the destruction of the Bosnian cities, this neologism that had been used sporadically since 1963 was defined in scholarly terms within social, legal, and urban planning theories. The destruction of home and homeland was also performed through rape and the destruction of domestic architecture. The persistence of cultural memory through the symbolic and physical forms of the house, the house-related rituals, and the women's role therein is a noticeable characteristic of Bosnian landscapes. The systematic violation of both women and houses were one of the major manifestations of nationalist programs and the uh, associated virulent masculinity. Since urbanity is constituted by heterogeneity, urbicid comprises the destruction of the conditions of the heterogeneity, argues Calvert. This targeting speaks of sophisticated knowledge in the charting of the war. It petitioned. Would the knowledge of post-war heritage restoration be as sophisticated and systematic? It took five years to start profiled and efficient implementation of annexes six, seven, and eight of Dayton Accords. After the armed conflict had ceased, the first post-war years were still filled with tension, fear, distrust, and confusion. The process of return of refugees and displaced persons was stuck. People did not feel safe to go back even when they were offered international or foreign aid to restore their homes. Furthermore, places of their return were so systematically destroyed that they could not recognize them as their uh, memory escape or their uh, zavichai, what is the Bosnian word, that um, it has the same meaning as a heima as, and is not um, easy to be translated into English. Here, I will shortly explain why, in spite of priorities based on authorized heritage discourse, victims of war insisted to reconstruct mosque first. For victims, reconstructing the mosque in their place of return was considered a central symbol of such reclaimed home, a testament to their place in the world and their right to public expressions of identity. My research in Eastern and Southern Bosnia informs that even for those who are not themselves Muslims, reconstructing damaged mosques can be a meaningful part of the process of overcoming insecurity, desecration, and dispossession. They too have been deprived of their homescape by ethnic cleansing of others. Their loss is contained in two key physical negative aspects of their life landscape, emptiness and absence. Both emptiness and absence tend to destroy what the Bosnians call komšilk or neighborhood as community, a major factor in Bosnian cultural landscape. The demand that mosques be reconstructed was thus conceived as a first step in coming to terms with the legacy of ethnic cleansing. Feeling the emptiness that appeared when the mosques were destroyed with the familiar forms, contempt, uses, and customs offers the hope of return to stability, which is solely needed by all those whose homescape has been stripped away in one way or another. Neither return nor the loss of one's homescape, however, is a simple matter. It can be symbolic, physical, formal, and existential. After the destruction, the remnants of the Bosnian mosques were transported away to be thrown into the beds of rivers and lakes and rubbish dumps, 
or in some cases buried in the ground alongside the bodies of murdered Muslims. In the summer of 2004, parts of the 16th century Alaja Mosque in Focha were found during the excavation of a mass grave. The finely decorated and lavishly colored blocks loomed forth from the seven meter deep pit. The mosque was dynamited on the 2nd August, 1992, St. Elijah's Day, a festival celebrated by both Muslims and Orthodox Christians in Bosnia in parallel. The destroyers followed the pattern of a destruction liturgy that exploited the sacred calendar and components of the biblical rituals of consecration by blood to achieve purification, not only of the land, but of all forms of collective memory after the Muslim population had been killed or expelled. The Alaja Mosque is just one of more than a thousand Bosnian mosques destroyed that summer. Its high symbolic value in Bosnian memory scapes is reflected in narratives and in the transmission of personal experiences. Each of these narratives is a myth forming combination of reality and imagination. This is not least because the reality was so intense unimaginable and unbearable that it has made the surreal seem equally possible. Those who survived the massacres in Focha continue to repeat a story that the call for prayer would echo from the vacant site of destroyed Alaja Mosque. Most of my interlocutors from Focha have repeated the story in one way or another. A Bosnian Serb Orthodox Christian woman from Foča heard the call for prayer, Evam, coming from the site of Alaja Mosque on three successive evenings, starting on 2nd August 1992, when the town was ethnically cleansed. She lived close to the site, and uh, through her confusion and horror, noticed that her neighbors were also behaving as though they too heard it. Munira, a Muslim woman, would pass the site of the mosque every day on her way to the prison where her husband had been detained and witnessed that every time they tried to begin their work of destruction, the call for prayer, Evan, would reverberate of the walls and the machines would mysteriously stop. The legend and the burial method both make clear the symbolic halo of the mosque in Bosnian cognitive maps and how it extends beyond the merely physical. The reconstruction of destroyed mosques in Bosnia begins with the gathering up of their remains or fragments. When the Croat military forces destroyed four mosques in the center of Stolac, another small historic town, in the south of Bosnia in August 1993, after all its Muslims had been expelled or confined to concentration camps, Emir managed to save himself by fleeing. He walked for days. Uh, between, it was almost more than 150 kilometers. Uh, between the various armies and a route to Sarajevo, which was then under siege. In his backpack, he was carrying a stone from destroyed Charsia Mosque from 16, early 16th century in Stolac. That day, Emir set down the stone on a desk in an office where I happened to be and bore his witness to the suffering of the people and destruction of the mosque as inseparable. It would only be in August 2001, eight years after its destruction, that systematic collection of the remains of the Charsia Mosque actually became possible. Emir was one of those who dug it out, stone by stone, from the earth, pulled it from the riverbed and from the garbage dumps. The area of the Charsia Mosque in the deserted town 
to which return was not allowed became an area for a divided and scattered people together for the collection of discarded fragments. Those fragments were then without fixing or hiding the traces of the violence committed against their original workmanship built into the reconstructed mosque. This was a work of cultural memory in which the scars of destruction and suffering were turned into additional features bearing symbolic and historic value. This is how Stolat's center that was totally leveled to the ground looks like now. After the demolishers had transported its remnants from the site of the Alaja mosque that I mentioned before in Focha and that dumped them in two locations, one part buried in the earth with the bodies of murdered Muslims, the other dumped in the river alongside, it would be children, Orthodox Christian children, who began the process of gathering up the remains. According to Milidrak, who insisted that his name is mentioned, and who said, we as children used to gather up the stones from the Chehotina river. We keep them, the fragments, in a burnt out house. Between this childish attempt to save at least the fragments of memory and the thorough official program of excavation, documentation, and storing of the stones of the Alaja mosque, some 13 years would pass. The process of reestablishing the mosque took 27 years from destruction to reconstruction. Samira escaped Focha 27 years ago. I don't go there. The smell of blood hangs in the air. Asked whether she will go once the Alaja mosque has been fully restored, she says, I would like to. There is something that draws me still. The reconstruction of the mosque surely has not power to fill the emptiness and absences in Milidrag's and Samira's homescape. But on the day that the mosque was reopened, they both could find a common ground to return to, even if only in virtual fashion. Through a number of projects, the reconstruction of mosques was harnessed as a trauma processing tool. The very reconstruction has become a common ground especially for young people from different communities to come to terms with transgenerational trauma. The same, in fact, was with the reconstruction of historic churches. And here you can see some photos. In the parallel domain of the authorized heritage discourse, the turnover was marked by a number of events and it was accomplished due to clear demand of those who were returning to their homes and who claimed rights to rehab rehabilitate their memory scapes. Um, First, I'm gonna to have to ask you to um, start to wrap up. You have about just over a minute left. Okay. Firstly, Director General and UNESCO President, in fact, uh, and the Mayor Mostar signed a document on global partnership for reconstruction of old bridge in Mostar, which started the preparatory process for its restoration in 1998. On the other hand, the expert and academic dissonances concerning the conventionally established set of values, authenticity issues and conservation practices what prevails tangible or intangible significance of destroyed sites? Should emotions be interdicted in the post-war heritage policy definition? Is a heritage site renewable? And many other remained vocal. Opposition to people-centered participative approach expressed through academic exclu exclusivism has been persistent. Um, I will go to the end. These are some photos of the reconstructed sites that you can see in Bosnia because reconstruction in fact has become uh, some kind of healing or processing trauma that um, has still been present in Bosnia. And I will uh, conclude with uh, Freud's words in his um, a seminal letter uh, uh, to uh, Einstein just at the threshold of the Second World War, whatever makes for cultural development is working also against war. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Amra, for really a, a very beautiful, evocative, and moving um, presentation, and which has given us, I think, a lot of food for thought. Um, particularly, um, particularly well conveyed was just this power of fragments for holding on to the past, but also in attempting to construct cohesive narratives and memories. Um, I think that came across just powerfully in your paper. So thank you very much for that. Our fourth and um, final paper this morning is, will be given by Maria Rita Achitoso. Maria is a cultural specialist with more than 10 years of experience in the field of tangible heritage management and cultural cooperation at both national and international levels. She received a PhD in conservation of cultural heritage and an MAS in conservation of cultural and natural heritage from the University of Rome and a degree in architecture from the University of Venice. She joined UNESCO in 2015, serving as senior project manager in charge of coordinating UNESCO's initiatives for the protection and management of cultural physical resources, first in Afghanistan and then in Iraq. In both cases, her focus was on cultural heritage resources as tools for social cohesion and sustainable development. She's currently leading the UAE funded project for the reconstruction of historical landmarks in the old city of Mosul. Her paper today is titled Reviving the Spirit of Mosul, the reconstruction of cultural landmarks as a tool to foster reconciliation in post-conflict recovery. Maria, I hand the floor over to you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, let me just share my screen. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, I think so. Yes. So, okay. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my presentation relates uh, to the ongoing UNESCO work uh, in Mosul, Iraq, where we are currently supporting the Iraqi government in its efforts to reconstruct and rehabilitate the city's urban heritage and landmarks after the end of the conflict in 2017. Um, the city of Mosul, meaning the linking point in Arabic, has been for millennia a strategic crossing and a commercial and cultural link between the north, the south, the east, and the west. Its history has been characterized since its origins by a multi-religious and multicultural environment, which includes uh, mosques, but also churches and synagogues. Unfortunately, Mosul became the target of violent extremism in, in 2014, conflict struck the city. Three devastating years of conflict passed, leaving Mosul in ruins, its heritage sites uh, reduced to rubble, and thousands of its inhabitants displaced, leaving them with immense humanitarian needs. It is to respond to these needs that the UNESCO Direct Director General launched in February 2018 the initiative Revive the Spirit of Mosul. Reviving Mosul is not only about reconstructing heritage sites, it is about empowering the population as agents of change involved in the process of rebuilding their city through culture and education. The initiative, in fact, is built around three main pillars, uh, of course, interlinked, uh, heritage, education, and uh, cultural life. Uh, the case pr presented today um, is implemented within the framework of the initiative, and it is responding uh, specifically to pillars one and three. Uh, the project that is funded by the United Arab Emirates is aimed at rebuilding iconic historical landmarks in the old city of Mosul as tools to foster social cohesion and reconciliation in the post-conflict context. Specifically, the project works on three uh, very important monumental sites. Uh, the famous Al Nuri complex, which includes the iconic Al Hadba minaret dated back to the, on the, to the end of the 12th century. 
the Altajira Syriac Catholic Church, located in the district of historical churches, and the al um, church complex, both dated back to the 19th century. The project started in 2019, and since its first conception, the project does not consider uh, reconstruction only from the perspective of the physical reinstatement of lost monuments. Rather, it includes a strong component of community engagement. In fact, uh, the um, project is built around two uh, interlinked main outcomes. The first one, which is the actual and physical reconstruction of landmarks and the reactivation of cultural life in Mosul, and the second one, that has as main focus skill development and job uh, creation. Uh, now, uh, the decision of working on historical landmarks is in a way in line with the recognized rule that culture can play in a post-disaster and especially post-conflict context. Um, if we look at the World Bank UNESCO position paper, The Cure, historical landmarks are specifically mentioned under principle two, uh, which states that it is possible to starting from there the reconciliation process exactly with the reconstruction of cultural landmarks and places of, of significance to local communities. And that this can be prioritized in the reconstruction process as focal points of the social recovery process. Uh, the document also highlights the importance of engaging communities and local governments in every st step of the recovery process. So in the case of Mosul, uh, it was very much important for us uh, to elaborate since the beginning a strategy to optimize the involvement of the community in the different phases of the process. To do that, we have been trying to answer some key main questions. So, for example, understanding uh, what community could be in post-conflict Mosul, uh, identifying the different target groups, and also identifying the different steps of the process and how to modulate involvement modalities at the different stages in order to ensure that our approach was effective enough. The result was the preparation of a community engagement plan that, of course, we are updating and reviewing conti continuously across the process, where basically this is seen in a way as a circle uh, that has like uh, four, let's say, main interlinked steps to inform, to consult, to involve, and then uh, step by step to ask actually the main stakeholders to evaluate the effect in a, the effectiveness of the support that we are practically providing. Uh, now, these main fields of action uh, then correspond to different activities which are modulated and implemented in a different way depending on combined considerations, including at least the target group and the specific phase of the project or message to pass. This includes, of course, our narrating activities, um, but also uh, consultation, job creation, training and coaching, also um, through uh, direct uh, uh, opportunities um, uh, of job, of course. Um, <clears throat> these activities, as I said, are, of course, all interlinked, and uh, if properly implemented, they can also contribute to uh, each other. Um, an emblematic case to uh, understand the criticality of the consultation process, especially in terms of ensuring empowerment and sense of ownership of the local community, is in fact the case of the Al-Nuri uh, complex and of its two main monuments, the Al-Nuri Prayer Hall and the Al-Adba Minaret. You can see from these photos the level of distraction of court uh, on both sides. Uh, so you can see uh, on the left uh, the uh, prayer hall before the 2017 distraction, and then uh, at the bottom how we found uh, the mosque uh, after the conflict, and then as well, um, the famous Al Hadba Minaret um, before the destruction and then um, after the conflict, with uh, of course uh, the majority of its uh, physical integrity completely lost. Uh, it was clearly, I mean, it was uh, clear immediately that this level of destruction would have requested 
the implementation of a serious consultation to identify recognized values and to make sure that these values were respecting at least the expectation of uh, the majority of the community in order to uh, start in a proper way the, the reconstruction process. Uh, this was done in parallel with the urgent operation of site clearance and temporary stabilization and included, of course, in parallel a research done with local experts in order to understand the phases of transformation of the complex. Here you can see an example of the reconstruction done for the Anuri complex, where you can see that actually the complex had gone through major transformation, mainly occurred in 1944, with a major transformation, especially of uh, the prayer hall. Um, these were uh, important factors to be, uh, to be uh, taken into consideration, also because actually the area of work that we were uh, requested to uh, consider is actually on an, a, a large area of work that was also included like an additional area on the West, where basically the main stakeholder, mainly the Sunni endowment, which is the owner of the site, but also the Ministry of Culture wanted actually to uh, include additional education and cultural functions to be annexed to uh, the original perimeter of the complex. Now, uh, how we have been practically doing consultation? Well, the project has to start with uh, two uh, permanent mechanisms of consultation, one happening at the local level that is called the Joint Technical Committee, which basically gathers uh, local authorities, experts, and representatives of the community. Here you can see a photo of the meetings. And actually, the rule of the Joint Technical Committee is to provide us with technical advices across uh, the different steps of the project. It gathers at least uh, on a quarterly basis, but actually now we are even increasing the number of the meetings because we are at a critical step of the, of the process. and. Uh, second committee, which is the joint steering committee uh, that gathers usually uh, a couple of uh, times a year, um, is uh, a committee at the central level, which includes ministers from relevant ministries and the donor and has the rule of uh, providing uh, strategic advices and approving strategic steps based on the advices of the joint technical committee. Of course, uh, these two committees are not enough to engage the community. So um, one uh, example of an additional uh, um, uh, activity that we have been doing in terms of consultation was the community survey to select the reconstruction options for the mosque and the minaret. This was done in collaboration with the University of Mosul uh, in order to uh, ensure that we were reaching um, a, a important sectors of the Muslawi community, including, of course, uh, IDPs, so those uh, currently uh, displaced in camps. Um, and the results of this survey that then were used actually to uh, lead uh, the reconstruction process were then presented in some public events. Again, uh, here one photo of an event convened at the University of Mosul immediately after the conclusion of the uh, survey. Uh, of course, the consultation needs to be modulated uh, according to the different phases of the project. So for example, now we are increasing the number of bilateral meetings with local experts because the project now is going through the process of designing solutions for the physical reconstruction. So actually, uh, receiving their inputs and keeping them involved in all the decisions that are taken, it's of course a, a critical contribution to the success of the project itself and of course of the consultation that we, um, we are uh, undertaking. Um, now, uh, this is just to give some data, uh, only in 2021 we have been convening more than 41 events uh, as part of the community uh, engagement and the consultation, many of them, uh, again, meeting down with uh, Iraqi experts and representatives of the communities 
uh, in order to uh, keep them involved and engaged in uh, the decision before the APA reconstruction will start. Uh, of course, another critical way of um, involving the community is uh, the, uh, the, 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 the job creation. Um, and this is very much important because, for example, in the case of the preliminary phases um, of the project, which were related to uh, the demining, the rubber removal, and the temporary stabilization, we had to uh, elaborate a strategy um, able to, on one side, address the technical complications of this specific task, and on the other side, the need of involving as much as we could uh, local uh, workers, local partners, local contractors, and local experts. So uh, what we uh, decided to do was basically to um, invest on uh, a targeted expertise, actually only one uh, very high profile expert specialized in this field, and then for the rest, work exclusively with uh, local experts, uh, partners, and contractors. Um, this is the site uh, after the uh, completion of the operation of rubber removal and temporary stabilization. Uh, and uh, of course, as part of this process, it was very much important also to work uh, with the, ministry, the Iraqi Ministry of Culture. Here you can see the work that they have been doing, the amazing work that they have been doing in inventoring and cataloging all the fragments coming from the process of rubber removal and the mining um, that will be uh, reused uh, in the reconstruction process. Um, and here you can see some local carpenters building the complex structures that we designed for the temporary stabilization of the remains. I would like to highlight that at the very beginning, they didn't have necessarily uh, the skills to uh, do that, but we provided them with trainings uh, on site. And this is the result that after a few days, they were able to go ahead by themselves. And of course, this um, uh, gives them also uh, an important feeling of ownership because they were the ones actually, in a way, uh, saving their minaret and their mosque. Um, and this is the mosque, how it looks now after, I mean, how it was looking immediately after the, the, uh, the completion of this preliminary uh, operation. Now, um, of course, I mean, we are applying the same strategy uh, to all the other sites. This is a photo of the, of the Al-Tahira Syria Catholic Church. Uh, the target for the project was to create uh, 1,100 jobs uh, over a period of five years. Now we have still uh, more than two years ahead and we have already um, created 1,031 jobs uh, out of the target of 1,100. So we are uh, confident that we will be able, of course, also to pass the target by uh, actually the end of the project. And you can see that the strategy uh, that, of course, requires more time and more efforts from our side, but it's worth it because even in the, in the percentage of internationals and Iraqi uh, companies or experts involved, you can see that uh, already we are at the percentage of 70% against uh, 30%. Now, an important part, of course, of uh, uh, our work is also to, um, to uh, in, in, uh, improve uh, the local skills, um, this is a work uh, that relates uh, very much on archaeology, architecture, and engineering, but still um, the work on historical monuments is in a way quite complex, so it offers actually the possibility, especially for young professionals to experience the different steps. So here, for example, some photos of the investigations done uh, around the minaret, on the right, the archaeological excavations done um, for investigating the foundation, and on the left, all the measures 
done to investigate the structures um, and the stratigraphy of the remains. Um, and uh, also uh, the steps related to the survey, to the documentation, to the design until uh, the execution of uh, conservation samples that will uh, allow us to establish uh, detailed protocols to treat the surfaces. You can see one example from the Altahira uh, Syria Catholic Church on the right. Um, Maria, so, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to, um, to come yes. for the conclusion. Yes, I'm concluding that. Uh, yes, thanks. I'm concluding even in advance. Um, so um, actually, um, this is uh, a, a component, one of job uh, of on the job training that for us has been critical since the very beginning, and that is of course combined with um, a targeted two year program that we have been developing for craftsmen and local professionals with uh, in collaboration with uh, ECROM. Um, I would like just to uh, say that um, uh, at the practical level. Uh, when we have to, um, in a way, uh, strike a balance in between uh, the expectations of the donors, um, restrictions in terms of time frame, um, it is very, very important if we want to be uh, effective in terms of community engagement. And if we really do believe that monuments can contribute to that, well, then this needs to be addressed since the very beginning. And it's uh, something that cannot be left uh, aside, but it has to be at the core of the daily management of the project. And as I said, uh, skill development and job creation for us are very much important also because I do believe that skill development is at the basis of the sustainability of the support that we are bringing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, again, another really rich paper. And um, I really appreciated the focus of your presentation on the people on the ground. And I think it both, both highlighted not only the importance, but also the complexity of involving a broad base of the community, or really perhaps of the communities that exist in a particular place. Um, I'm sure that um, we're going to, uh, to be revisiting many of the ideas um, in your paper as we continue onward. So thank you for that. If I may um, move into the reflection round, I'm going to very briefly um, introduce our distinguished um, panel members who are part of this reflection round. Ellie Harrowell is an assistant professor in the Center for Trust, Peace and Social Relations at Coventry University. Um, and Fida Tuma was appointed Director General of AM Catan Foundation in 2019. And Trinidad Rico is the Director of the Cultural Heritage and Preservation Studies Program in the Art History Department of Rutgers University. Welcome all three of you. Um, I have um, a few questions for each of you, but Given our time constraints, I think I'm going to start off with one question for each of you at a time, if that's okay. And then if there's time, I may ask each of you a second question. If I can start off with Ellie. Ellie, I know that you're currently working on a project with ECRAM to build heritage-based indicators of peace and conflict that are drawn directly from community perceptions. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Because I think it's very pertinent to our discussions this morning. Sure thing, thank you. And, and thank you uh, to everyone for sharing their papers this morning. It's been really enjoyable to sit here and, and, and listen. Um, I will endeavor to say something meaningful in four minutes um, and hope I'm, I'm successful in this. Uh, but I think it's a great question to start on, particularly leading on from this presentation on, on Mosul, because I think that very aptly showed why uh, thinking about community voices and how to uh, engage um, heritage communities in these uh, processes is so important. Um, I think there's a clear message that heritage can't support people in coming to terms with violence and trauma. Um, and make a contribution to a peaceful future if decisions around this aren't inclusive of their voices. 
Um, and I think we've seen a, a paradigm shift, a belated and unfortunately slow paradigm shift um, towards privileging local expertise and participatory methods within the fields of heritage, peace and development more widely. I should make the disclaimer, I'm not actually a heritage professional. I come from the field of peace and conflict studies. Um, the question, of course, is how do we do that? How do we make sure people's voices um, can be included? And I, I'm happy to share the example of the project that I'm working on with ICROM at the moment, um, because that seeks to address this question of how and propose a, a methodology that is um, accessible to heritage professionals to use in, in making this happen. And this builds on some kind of synergies that I see as being a bit unexploited between the work that we're doing in the world of peace and conflict studies and the work that's going on incredibly valuably in the world of heritage um, and heritage studies and heritage uh, practitioners. So the community-based uh, heritage indicators of peace project is something I'm working on with ICROM where we're trying to adapt another methodology, which is is called the Everyday Peace Indicators Methodology, which was developed by Professor Roger McGinty and Dr. Pamina Furchow. That methodology is used for measuring peace in uh, peace building projects and conflict affected communities. We're trying to make it more accessible for people specifically working on heritage in conflict affected areas. Measuring peace and predicting uh, kind of the direction of travel between peace and conflict is one of the biggest challenges for anybody who works in a conflict affected ses setting, including working to preserve or restore heritage. And that question of how can you tell if your intervention is supporting a move towards peace or if you how can you get an advance warning if a situation is actually sliding back towards violence is really difficult. And many of the tools that we have to address that and to answer those questions have been kind of top down metrics and very focused on indicators of violence because they're easier to see and to measure, you know, to count how many displaced people there are, what has been the physical damage to a monument or to a heritage site. Peace is kind of generally more difficult to quantify, um, but the problem with having these top down metrics, whilst they do serve a purpose, they genuinely reflect the priorities and the worldview of international actors rather than the experiences and the knowledge and the priorities of the communities that are most affected by what's going on. And this works to exclude locally generated knowledge. It distances communities from what's going on and it misses some of the subtleties and the specificities of locally grounded knowledge about what does peace actually look and feel like to different communities in different places around the world in different points of that conflict, post-conflict peace building spectrum. So with ICROM, we're trying to develop that uh, everyday peace indicators methodology into a tool for heritage professionals who want to understand how does their work intersect with and affect prospects for building peace. And crucially, how is peace defined and expressed from the bottom up, from the communities they're working with? And I think this chimes actually with what Dacia was beginning to say about um, when they went to Cambodia and asked communities what do they really want in order to help repair their, their dignity and their peace. So the aim is to provide a, a toolkit to ensure that communities are systematically uh, included from the start in defining what peace looks and feels like. And again, this is um, in the presentation about Mosul, it, it's, it's made the important point that that is something that needs to be engaged from the very beginning. Um, we're working to develop a methodology of um, uh, deliberative workshops um, that generate these locally grounded indicators, um, but then put these indicators in terms that are easily communicable in both ways. So that are meaningful and understandable for people on the ground, but also meaningful and understandable for policy audiences and founders uh, and funders, sorry. Um, and this is really important because people's attitudes towards heritage in particular often reflect wider social conflicts or opportunities for reconciliation. So we think grounding these indicators in heritage will help to really make this um, an understandable, meaningful process for everyone engaged. We think that community generated heritage um, based indicators of peace can make us, um, can be a way of ensuring that measuring and thinking about peace is uh, culturally situated not overly generalized and top down. And the conversations about this, and when we talk and ask questions about it and ask about how to measure it, that 
we're not doing it in a way that's coded in jargon and project speak and you know kind of all caught up in talking about log frames and so on um so that's that's what we're doing at the moment and i think it it, it does um feed in quite nicely to some of these discussions that that we're having this morning um i'm very happy for people to to get in touch if they want to hear more about the project um we're finalizing the first draft of the methodology at the moment um amra has been uh, very generous with her time and expertise feeding into some of the discussions we've been having about it um, and, and do get in touch if you'd like to learn more about what we're doing there. Thanks so much, Ellie. Um, I think that's a um, very provocative way of thinking about it. As peace as something that's culturally situated rather than just some kind of general umbrella abstract term. Um, I think that's a really fa fascinating and important point to, uh, to begin with. And what it looks like and feels like kind of from the ground level upward, um, well, it's an opportunity for fascinating and obviously endless research. So um, <laughs> thank you very much for that. Fida, if I may turn next to you. Um, I know that you've been working um, with, uh, with Palestinians for a very long time and the, the camps themselves have been in existence for some 70 years. I'm wondering, in the attempt to move people out of the camps to resettle them, what new type of trauma might come from that displacement from the camps where presumably new cultures, a new kind of heritage has been in the building over the past seven decades? So I, I'm wondering if you could just reflect on that and perhaps tell us um, what, you, what ruptures you think, what traumas might be generated by such a move and how we could perhaps prevent it or minimize it. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you all for this invitation. Actually, uh, the way I started thinking about this, I practiced uh, cultural conservation and architectural conservation for more than 17 years and then moved on to a new practice of working in intangible cultural heritage or mainly just cultural productions. And over the past few years, I've been visiting Palestinian, I don't know, I, I'm Palestinian, I live in Palestine, I'm currently in Gaza, but I've had uh, the privilege to visit even Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon and in Jordan. And the thought of, the thought that haunted me and others as well is that over the years, when you have uh, a cultural rupture or the erasure of uh, cultural heritage and people are displaced, like what happened in Cambodia or any other places around the world, people are moved. So in theory, in theory, the reparations or healing or peace would come by erasing that area, that time of displacement and bringing people back. And my question is, if this is a, 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 not a temporary placement, displacement, it's a continuous displacement. It's a continuous case of temporariness. And over those years, over the 70 years that have passed for Palestinians, it's permanent temporariness. I'm now, I don't know in 70 years, how many generations that would be. But now uh, the shock, for, not the shock, the thing that started me thinking when I was in Lebanon, People don't have a view of what Palestine looks like now. Their image of their village, of their hometown, of their heritage is what their parents or grandparents transferred to them. So they created this frozen image of a heritage. Okay, they do have the intangible, they do have the symbols, they build, they use them, they, they build their own communities, etc. But they have a frozen image of what they're coming back to, which is definitely not, does not exist anymore. At the same time, they created the, their hubs of memory. The camps are hubs of memory. The networks of camps are hubs of memory. It's uh, the creation of the camp itself is a healing attempt to recreate the social connectedness between the communities that were displaced. So if you want to heal, and if you, I'm going back to what was discussed, it's like to re heal, to imagine peace as a community, to imagine what would healing look like. Uh, for people in the abstract, it's to erase those 70 years and go back. 
to where things started. I don't think, and I don't think that's a possible thing anymore. If you're erasing those 70 years, you're also losing all the healing process that went into those 70 years. So I think refugee camps, at least in the case of Palestine, because it's a really long conflict, uh, in those 70 years, that case of uh, refugeehood, if you want to call it, that case of that continuous attempts to heal using heritage, using all the symbols of heritage, the intangible, you know, in our case, the traditional dress, the kufiya, the cooking, the, all these were heightened to the awareness of people. But they now assume, um, like, they're put on a pedestal at some point, unaware that we're putting these on a pedestal. And, but we use them. The, the refu- and I think in the refugee com- communities, they were used as a healing. That, pa- that uh, process of putting them on a pedestal is also a healing process. So how would you account for all these healing attempts throughout all these years? And just at one point, okay, if peace ever arrives, what's next? Would we erase those refugee camps and delete them and forget all this healing process and bring people back? What kind of healing is that? I think another case that really struck us, I think when Yarmouk camp, when a huge Palestinian refugee camp was destroyed during the war in Syria, it was totally destroyed. All the people that were dispersed, all this knowledge, all this social context that was lost, it wasn't just a result of Syrian conflict. It was a loss for Palestinian history, Palestinian healing process, etc. So that's what I was thinking when it came to personal reflections in healing and dealing with all this trauma. And I think that there are actually two good friends of mine who are architects and artists at the same time, Sandy Hilal and Alessandro Patti, they have a collective called DAR. They just recently published uh, an art book, I would call it, called Refugee Heritage. And they're petitioning that refugee heritage should take a world heritage, should be acknowledged as world heritage at one point. It's using and misusing all the criteria for being named a world heritage, whatever (laughs) you want to call it, practice, what. Thank you, so, Peter. Thank you very it. much for these thoughts. Um, in fact, it, it, it just listening to you now has really broadened and complicated my thinking about the entire issue, that heritage is rebuilt in sometimes what are thought to be temporary settlements and um, that there could be a new trauma in displacing people. Um, thank you very much for, for this and for sharing your rich experience of working there over so many years. Um, Trinidad, I would like to um, just pose another question um, to you. When do you believe, I mean, given your, given your, your focus on this topic for such a long time, when do you believe heritage discourse becomes an obstruction to recovery and healing? Thank you, Trevor, and thank you, Amra, for um, inviting me to to contribute to this really great layout of talks. I'm going to raise some provocative thoughts, and I assume that when you know my work, you know what I'm going to do by now. Um, Keep the focus on on the actors here, and I'm very excited to follow Ellie and Fida because I think this is, in a way, tying into so many things you've already said. Um, I've always been fascinated. I'm not a preservationist. I'm an anthropologist who studies preservation discourses and practices. So I'm always kind of standing outside, not not pretending neutrality, but um, standing outside from perhaps that um, unilateral mission that a lot of these organizations have. So I'm not not intending to put words into anybody's mouths. Um, However, I do have some very uh, strong concerns. We think of heritage safeguarding as something that is uh, built on the idea that Preservation um, provides uh, an instructive, sustainable, and enriching possibility for a society. And in that that paradigm, we think of landscapes of the past as containing all of these qualities for healing. What I wonder is, 
what is the foundation of this premise? What type of data has been used to sustain this uh, dominant view? Um, for my doctoral work, right, is it more of an aspirational view or is it something that we can really quantify in some capacity? Uh, I took this to my doctoral research in Indonesia where I examined a rupture in this logic, if we can call it um, that way. I studied heritage preservation practices and debates following the 2004 tsunami um, that completely ravaged and leveled westernmost Indonesia, a town called Banda Aceh. Now confronting a landscape of post-destruction and armed with my own training in conservation, because I'm a, a former conservationist, um, I was invited in, in confronting this and I mean, I wish you know, I had imagery, a complete leveled uh, landscape. Um, I was wondering that perhaps the key question for our work should be this, we focus on possibilities and gains, but what is lost in the work of preservation? And what I want to do here is to draw attention to the responsibility that we have on calling preservation as this panacea, as this, as this healing strategy that operates in all contexts. In this context, in particular, of destruction, I am um, returning to a prior landscape may prevent social and cultural incorporations and valuations of a new landscape. So in particular, I'm thinking of the way in which um, commemoration and practices of care were invested on a new heritage, right? So it's, it's exactly in a way following from what Vida was commenting on, but from a more monumental and artistic sense. A new landscape of reconstruction in this particular case, uh, when we're looking at an unprecedented natural disaster, contained life-saving ingredients that needed to be preserved. So if we focus on a landscape that needs to return to its prior pre-tsunami phase, what we lose is the possibility of heritageizing a, a heritage that is very instructive, that is very life-saving, the knowledge, the resources, the race awareness of these environmental hazards. So in, in my view to raise this, and this is something that I've been publishing, it's very, very, very unpopular with preservationists, by the way, you can imagine why, to erase this, lands, this new landscape of heritage is very hybrid. I know, Ellie, you write about hybridity, and in a way, Fida, you're also talking about this. Uh, to erase it, I feel is to endanger society in some ways. It's a way in which like the preservationist mission is incredibly dangerous and needs to be deployed carefully. Uh, it's also neglecting the important work of reconciliation with a traumatic experience. I feel like I'm saying things you've already said by now, but that's what happens when you come last. Um, so <laughs> what did I, just, just to close on this, I know we're running out of time, but we need to keep considering the, the erasing power of preservation projects and narratives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Trinidad. I loved your term, Heritage, heritageizing. I mean, and, and to think too about the negative repercussions to kind of shift our focus a little bit. And again, think in more complicated terms about what is lost in that, uh, in that process. Um, and thank you for also pointing us or illustrating your theory with concrete examples. Um, that's really appreciated. I know from the chair of this of the panel that I have a couple of extra minutes. So can I ask each of you in turn to, to perhaps share one key takeaway from your participation in this panel session? Ellie, you may begin. We can go in that order. Thank you. Um, gosh, one key takeaway. How, how do you choose just one from such a rich discussion? Um, I guess uh, I, I would love to just pick up on, um, on something Trinidad just said then, and also that I think picks up on the threads that Dacia um, was talking about earlier on um, at you know, the very start of this panel. And that is that I think it's important to challenge one of the predominant um, approaches to the relationship between heritage and, and, and peace and recovering from, from violence um, using heritage that often underpins work in this area, which is this idea that heritage can and should be used to build some kind of unitary narrative, some, that there's some kind of um, magic 
narrative of shared peaceful identities that if you find the right kind of heritage, you can interpret it in the right way that will bring everyone together and create a peaceful future. And I, I think I'm probably on the same page um, with Trinidad here that actually I, I'd like to disrupt that idea a bit. And I'd like to leave that with my kind of, sure. as my um, takeaway for people to think about. Um, I work from a conflict transformational perspective, which says conflict isn't a bad thing. Conflict is disagreement. It's the most natural generative thing in the world. Violence is a bad thing. Violence is the problem here. And I think that if we could approach heritage uh, um, preservation, heritage reconstruction, heritage interventions in the wake of conflict um, from a conflict transformational approach that says, OK, what is the dialogue that can happen through and around this heritage? What is the way that we can sensitize each other to the different experiences, histories, narratives, some of which will be very painful, some of which will be very positive? that crystallize around this heritage, then that to me is the basis for actually using heritage in a, a, a way that underpins sustainable peace. And when I say peace, I mean peace from, from a justice um, and equity perspective, not just from the lack of, of bombs. It's, it's something lasting and, and constructive. So yeah, so that's, I, I would I'd just like to use my kind of one minute here in the spotlight to, to caution against this idea that heritage um, in response to conflict or post-conflict can somehow be the magic bullet that gives us a, a unitary narrative that we'll all find, you know, we can draw on the magic past to, to, to go forward. It's, I think there's something more nuanced and challenging there around how do we enable heritage to hold space for lots of different experiences and lots of different narratives. And the, the magic really is in the dialogue and the understanding between those. I agree with you entirely. And I think that speaks very strongly to Fida's example as well, where displacement has actually become the norm. It's no longer kind of just a marginal thing that happens on the side and then everything will go back to normal. Displacement has become the norm. So how can that, how can the displacement or even as you said, the conflict be productive? How can we see it perhaps in a new light? Thank you. Fida, if I may turn to you. I'll for your goal be very quick. I'll away. be super quick <laughs> because everything that has been said is very inspiring, actually. But uh, I'd like to go back to the idea of the hybridity of the use of heritage, the hybridity of voices, even within a community, the hybridity of how healing can happen, even within one community. It's not just one interpretation. And I, get, I fully agree. Heritage is not a tool. It's either interwoven and embedded with the practices and all those different voices, or you cannot even go further use, using it. And I'm saying that with caution. So my takeaway today is the, I don't know if it's a celebration, but it's the acknowledgement of this hybridity on all these different players. Thank you. Excellent, very succinct and very powerful. Thank you. Trinidad. You have the final you, word. Trevor. I get to have the final word. Hybridity, yeah. that's the final word. I think we all agree on. I think it's the first panel I sit in where we all agree on something. Um, I think it, I would simply put it down to let's apply the same critical lens on heritage practices and agendas as we do for perpetrators' agendas, in keeping with my explosive intervention. Thank you. We couldn't have finished more perfectly in timing. Thank you very much for that. Um, uh, thank you to all of the speakers today who have given us tremendous amount to, to think with, really moving papers that spoke to the theory but really grounded us in um, excellent case studies. And thank you to the participants um, who shared their reflections with us and also their own work. Um, much appreciated. So I will turn back over to Mohammed, who I expect will probably officially close our session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Trevor, for the excellent moderation and for timekeeping. It was a, a, an excellent job you did. Thank you very much. I would like also to thank all our speakers for their uh, very uh, inspiring interventions and uh, excellent presentations. They were all very uh, touching and uh, as I said, really inspiring. Uh, for now, I think we have one hour break. So have a good break.
take some rest and we will meet all in one hour, except for those that will be presenting uh, in the afternoon session. So please may we ask you to join us at least 15 to 10 minutes before that to do some testing. Thank you very much and see you later. Thank you.